Okay. Um, from beneath the surface, this is Here Be Monsters. I'm not sure how cold the water is supposed to be. I'm just going to go for um, cold enough so it registers as cold, but not so cold it hurts. Okay, <clears throat> I think I got the right temperature. I'm just going to go out into the living room so it's not so watery sounding. So it's end of season nine, and this has been a really challenging season to get out. It's also been really rewarding, too. You know, this was my first time in a long time releasing the show independently, and I'm really proud of the fact that I got 10 new episodes out, and I got to do some really fun things with sound. I got to talk to interesting people, and I also got to work with independent sponsors who are all listeners of this show, and that felt really great. Over 100 people signed up for the Here We Monsters Patreon, and I got some really supportive emails from all kinds of listeners, people who say that this show means something to them. And so those emails are really humbling, and I, I've read them all. I know I haven't responded to all of them yet, so thank you for all of that. And yeah, I'm, I'm really proud with how the season went. It was also really challenging, too. You know, I was kind of double isolated this year. I'm always a little bit isolated just in that I tend to work from home all the time. And, you know, with the pandemic happening before, during, and after this season comes out, yeah, I don't think I'm as resilient to isolation as I, I previously thought I might have been. Kind of the, the light at the end of the tunnel for me has often been my summers, you know, and I, I usually have been able to take off a month or so just to kind of recharge my batteries a bit. But for the past couple of years, I've kind of had big administrative life type things happening in those summers that have kept me working. And unfortunately, this summer, it's kind of looking like it'll be a big summer of administrative stuff, too. And I'm going to have a lot on my plate for kind of the near future. So I've made a decision that I didn't want to make, which is I'm not going to run the Summer Art Exchange this year. I love the Summer Art Exchange. I love connecting listeners to other listeners. But, you know, running that project is just a lot of administrative work. And I'm trying to keep my sanity here. So I hope you understand that decision. Yeah, and also related to that, you know, I, I don't have a date for you for when season 10 is coming out. It is going to happen. I'm just not quite sure when. I have some other obligations and opportunities that are all just a little bit fluid right now, and I'm just really not quite sure what my upcoming year looks like yet. So I wish I had a better answer for you on when season 10 is coming. But just know that I'll announce it first here on the podcast feed. You know, Here Be Monsters is a project that I feel really strongly about, and so I'm pretty sure that I'm going to keep this feed in my possession for the rest of my life. So yeah, this is the place. Stay subscribed. Yeah, I think that's about all the big news there is. So, um, let's go check on that bath. At this point, you might be asking yourself, Jeff, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? I have some questions about that, too. I am not excited about this. I deal really well with some kinds of physical pain, and I deal terribly with other kinds of physical pain. I'm going to dip my toes in. Ooh, that's pretty cold. Not the coldest it could be. <laughs> it's certainly not warm. Okay, so I'm going to set the recorder down. Hopefully I don't get it too wet. I'm just going to ease in with the understanding that I'm going to keep breathing. I'm trying not to tense up. That's pretty cold. I said I would stay in for... Um, at least five minutes, and I'm not going to make you uh, listen to all of that. So 
So, I'm most of the way in now, and I'm shivering, and I'm trying not to. But I don't feel like I'm in danger. Now, this is an episode that's about someone's personal story, not mine, someone else's. And that story has a lot to do with um, being cold. And I just want to be really clear in that I don't think it should be misconstrued as any kind of medical advice. I also want to mention that um, this story several times, it touches on um, suicidal ideation. And I know that can be rough to hear. I think it's important to the piece. And I should mention, it's not detailed. It's not really detailed in any way. It's just kind of mentions of it. But I understand that's not everyone's cup of tea. Okay. So yeah, I'm just going to try and um, slip my shoulders in and just relax into it and ease into it. Here Be Monsters, the podcast about a lot of empty spaces, the podcast about the unknown. The sponsor for this episode of Here Be Monsters is Animosis, which is a design company run by Emilius Martinez. Emilius is a web designer and illustrator, and I could tell you all day how much I like Emilius's approach to design. Or I could just direct your attention over to the new Here Be Monsters t-shirt, which is available for pre-order as of today. Emilius made this design, and I think it's so great. It's an image of a sunken building sitting on the ocean floor, and you're looking up at it, and the shape of the building is in the letters HBM, right? And then all around it, they're swimming these fish, and there's long strands of bullwhip kelp. And this design, it's so wonderful and beautiful and strange, and I think it fits this show so perfectly. And yeah, I'll talk about it more in the credits, but all this to say, I just really enjoyed working with Emilius on this design. Because not only is he an amazing artist, but he's also a great communicator. And so if you're working on a project, and you want an excellent designer or illustrator, just look up Emilius Martinez at animosus.com. That's A-N-I-M-A-S-U-S dot com. There's also a link in the show notes. So thank you, Animosis, for designing our new t-shirt and for sponsoring Here Be Monsters. So my name is Julia. I am 26. I live in the UK, in Gloucestershire, in this countrysidey town that's quite known for being quite alternative and very environmentally conscious. I'm in my bedroom, standing by the bookshelf, which has a mirror on top of it, and it's a bookshelf that's sitting on the floor. And the mirror's just the right height for my face, and I'm... Small, short, I have ginger hair, dark brown eyebrows, blue eyes. Sometimes when I look in the mirror, I look so haggard and drawn and like kind of old. But I think it's just the light of this area, this mirror. Because then when I look in other mirrors, I look kind of like naively young. My face has always looked young. 
whatever age I am, I've looked younger than that age. Some of the students that I work with like to laugh at that. Laugh at how small I am. And I'm looking in the mirror and around the room and on the dresser there's a brass bowl. A bronze bowl with a candle in it and a little glass church shaped candle holder which isn't because I'm religious but because I love churches and some jewellery and a piece of knotty wood I have a picture of a lamb and a Greek statue and a dog that I really love sitting on top of it all around the room there's pots that I've made coil pots which need to be glazed and my white covers of my bed, a sheepskin rag on the floor, scarves on the hooks, my yoga mat in the corner, a jade plant and candles on the windowsill. So many different things and so many different thoughts about the things that I feel. I feel so much all the time. Four years ago now, I had chronic fatigue syndrome. Four years ago it began, so it's coming up to a year now that I've been healed from it, and I had it for three years. The point at which I turned it around and, and became healthy again um, was the point where I was quite ready to die. And now I'm better. Sometimes I don't even think about being fatigued anymore. I think that there's this real misunderstanding of what chronic fatigue syndrome feels like. So I'm going to say what it felt like for me, and I'm sure lots of people had dif have had different experiences, but it's nothing like tiredness. It's not the same as tiredness. It's kind of similar to when you have the flu, how your body almost hurts to do anything, and your brain is also just not there. You couldn't read if someone was holding a book in front of your face. My feet were freezing cold all the time. I would have to have a hot water bottle on my feet and they would still not ever get warm. I felt like this desperation all the time, this kind of sense of needing something. I was having nightmares all the time and I was having hallucinations. Um, yeah, I just felt... Like my body was turning against me. It's the 6th of April and I'm sitting at the top of my garden in Stroud and it's snowing and I'm just looking at the lights of people's windows down in the valley and feeling the coldness. Listening to all of the dogs bark in the distance. Um, something that people have said to me lots is that I'm super sensitive. I get that all the time, especially from healers. I've always wondered if they kind of say that to everyone, you know, like tell everybody that they're special and tell everybody that they're, that they have the potential to be a healer or something like that. But um, I have some kind of esoteric thoughts about 
the kind of significance of my life. And I have this feeling that um, that there's some kind of importance to my life. But I'm also open to that not being true. I might just be just one of the average people who think they're not average. Should we do that again? Mm -hmm. Evening rise, spirit come. Sun goes down when the day is done. Mother Earth awakens me with the heartbeat of the I'm going to talk about the timeline and my experience of chronic fatigue syndrome. <clears throat> and I'm kind of forcing myself to do it because it's actually really painful and hard to think about how I felt in that time because it was, without a doubt, the worst feeling that I've ever experienced. So that's kind of why I'm doing it right now, because I'd rather not put it off. I'd rather just get it done and know that it's done. So I think it originated from a really broken heart, which came from a childhood of just r real, experiencing very real neglect, like neglect of my basic needs, like warmth and food and sense of safety which is complex because my mother is very loving and very present in my life now but but I grew up in a boarding house because my parents were boarding house parents they were kind of parenting these 56 girls who went to this private school and then also parenting me and my brother and apparently I would just run off and not be found for hours and hours. Um, when I was 14, my mum had breast cancer. My parents got divorced and I lived with my dad. I didn't see my mum for a couple of years while she was in hospital. I, you know, I'd see her like once or twice, but I didn't live with her and she wasn't parenting me and and I think that that was kind of the beginning of my heart breaking and in a way I feel like maybe some some people could have predicted it it was always coming it was always brewing but the way that it came into my life felt like a complete surprise it was Valentine's Day um, maybe like four years ago now and I went on a date with this guy that I'd been talking to for a while and it was our first date and we went and drank wine on the beach and went back to mine really late um, and the next morning I just couldn't get out of bed and I thought that it was a hangover and that I was just tired because I'd been working really hard. I just could, yeah, I just couldn't get out of bed. And that was the beginning of it. For a while I rested for I think maybe two weeks and then I just wasn't feeling better and I was really losing it, like my mind was becoming really foggy and I was really struggling to make the journey <coughs> into work, I was really struggling to cycle. It got so difficult and so painful that um, 
I remember just crying at work one day and just like standing by the window and just crying because I was just so exhausted and my body was hurting and I was going to the doctor and they were saying maybe it's a pituitary tumour or maybe you're iron deficient or maybe it's your thyroid they were taking all these blood tests um, nothing was coming up they were saying that I'm perfectly healthy I would have these big crashes where I couldn't move for a while and everything in my body just felt bad it felt like the, my blood was poisoned and it was kind of trying to bust out of my skin and it just didn't feel like anybody cared really while I felt like I was dying and there was a lot of fear there for me as well you know fear that I was just never going to get better I used to ask ask people if they thought I would ever get better because I just so badly needed to hear someone say it. And then um, the next six months, I basically spent in one room. Um, I could barely even really wash myself. I remember feeling that brushing my teeth was just an insane amount of energy output for me. My arm would hurt. I became, like, re really... I wasn't able to care for my needs. My my mum had to cook for me and bring me the food and I needed her to leave the minute that she brought it in because having a conversation took too much energy and I would sleep the whole day and then I would wake be awake for a few hours in the evening and I might try and watch something but I kind of couldn't even really focus on that. It was like that for six months and felt like the in-between stage between being alive and dead, yeah. Nevuria mancha, apetitista merula. It's about 10 o'clock and I'm just getting ready for bed. I'm taking my hair out of its plaits, putting some oil in it and putting it up back into plaits again. Um, haven't had time to wash it for a while and I won't have time tomorrow morning before work and it looks pretty dirty but where I work is the kind of place where you can get away with that. I work on a therapeutic farm slash craft college for um, teenagers and young adults with learning disabilities and mental health problems and some new lambs have been born so tomorrow super early I have to get up walk through the forest go and hang out with the lambs which should be great um, I was just thinking about how my dreams used to be when I was fatigued and how um, vivid they were uh, in the beginning of being ill I would have dreams almost every night about being pregnant having a, a pregnant belly 
But I also had dreams about things like being pushed out. Like I, would, I had this one dream of, um, there was a hole in my tights in the dream and it was on my knee. And I saw something in the hole or in my knee and um, squeezed it and a tiny snail came out. That was one. And another one was that I had this black spot on my hand and squeezed that and a um, little sunflower seed came out. Jamba di sta merula Jamba ja pera peonia A merula surula ju A pizzi che sata cori risata cinci minete jurula ju Nevuria mancha U capu di sta merula Kapu kapera pe jamba ja onya u Marula shurula shu A piti kaseta kori riseta chinchi mineta jurula ju Hello, it's Julia. Um I'm coming up to do the day shift and um, I'm on my way but I'm gonna be a little bit late. That's great, thank you so much. Okay, thanks a lot, bye. Pera peonia wu. Merla shurula shu. My brother went to a workshop and he met a woman there. And somehow I was brought up in conversation and she said to my brother, I can fix her. And by this point, I really, I'd tried a lot of alternative therapies and I was just ready to give up. And I was very realistically thinking that if I didn't get better that I would have to kill myself because I just wasn't willing to live in pain all the time. I never made an attempt, but I felt very sure that if something didn't change soon that there wasn't really any other option for me. Um, so this woman, cat came into my life and I went to her for hypnotherapy. I went really not believing. When I went to this woman's house, she sat me down in a chair and she put me into a trance, like a hypnotized trance. And, and then from there, she gave me these exercises to do. I would have to wake up in the morning and visualize my perfect day and write it down as if it was already happening. And then somewhere within my day, I would have to immerse myself in cold water. So every day I would get on my motorbike and go down to the sea, which was like 15 minutes away on the bike and go for a swim in the cold winter sea. And um, as it got warmer and as I got healthier, I would then go for a walk afterwards, after my cold swim. And I just started to get better. And then I just started to feel like a different person, started to look like a different person.
and it became kind of addictive, this cold water thing. And I just saw a huge, drastic change that was almost instant. It was within two weeks I felt completely different. I was suddenly strong again. I think that the science is something to do with retraining the parasympathetic nervous system. But for me, it feels like such a kind of spiritual high and it feels so real that I almost don't want to know the science behind it. I just think of it as this extreme with so much potential. It's one of my dreams to go and swim under some ice or make a hole in some ice and swim in that. That would be an ultimate dream, an ultimate goal. But when I get into the water, I slow my breathing down and I make sure that I don't tense against it and just try and kind of surrender to the sensation of it and not see the sensation as negative. Maybe that's one of the reasons that the water, the cold water helped me, is that it pushed me to breathe deeply even when it was difficult. It's so funny having this conversation with myself. There's a lot of empty spaces. There's moments when I'm swimming in cold water either in the sea or in the lake, when I try and look in the opposite direction of the shore, so like, I guess the horizon, and really feel in that moment that I could be anywhere in the world. It's harder in lakes, but... but it is possible, especially at night. Especially in silence. Because... The bird sounds and the night sounds become almost strange because we don't hear them all the time. You have to go and hear them. They're not just there all the time, these birds. You have to go to them. Discovered the best way to get to this water, the yeah. cold water, is to sing the rainbow song. Every little sound in my body is happy. Every little sound in my body is well. Every little sound in my body is happy. Every little sound in my body is well. Every little sound in my body is well. I'm so glad every little sound in my body is happy and well. I'm so good. <laughs> When I'm in cold water, it just like pulls me in to this clarified state of being in my body and there's no room to analyze it because I'm just so present and it feels now like an essential like I almost kind of hunger for it and I think also that's what I love about teaching singing is it pulls me into my body in this way where there's just trying to be in that song with the people so that I can guide them 
what you can't see in the recording is you listen to each other really closely and you look at each other's faces and try and understand what's coming next or how the song goes if you don't know it yet. Yeah. Well, maybe when I retire or when I'm an old lady or something, that will be my life. Leading choirs, walking dogs, swimming in cold water. They must be primal urges. Evening rise, spirit come. Sun goes down when the day is done. Mother Earth awakens me with the heartbeat of the sea. Julia Suzara lives in Gloucestershire, in the United Kingdom. She swims or bathes in cold water nearly every day. Now, as you know, I tried it for myself in the bathtub, and I I survived. And it was difficult. It really was difficult, but I'm definitely going to do it again. When I got out, I felt really refreshed and alive in this way that actually kind of surprised me. And so, yeah, I'm going to do it again. But one thing I want to reiterate is that this episode is not meant as medical advice, but instead just a reminder that things can and do get better, even when they seem hopeless. In the show notes and on the website, I've put the phone numbers for some different suicide prevention hotlines in different parts of the world, where I know that there are Here Be Monsters listeners. Our website is hbmpodcast.com. Now, my name is Jeff Entman, and I produced this episode. Music came from Julia's choir group and The Black Spot. Now over on the website right now, you can pre-order the new Here Be Monsters t-shirt designed by Emilius Martinez from Animasis. The shirt is lovely, and it will be shipping soon. And you can see it at hbmpodcast.com slash store. Now this is the end of Season 9. Thank you so much for coming along. I'm going to spend... Um, a little bit of time soon here writing up my reflections on the season and my plans for the future. I also have a couple questions kind of top of mind about the show that I'd really like some feedback on. So I'm I'm kind of working on this right now. This is going to be a text thing that I I post. It's going to be like my my state of the podcast address, if you will. And I'm going to write this up and I'm going to post it on the show's Patreon page. But it's going to be a public post, so you don't have to be a patron to look at it or comment or whatever. It's, it's going to be totally public. So I'm going to be posting this soon, probably mid-July, at patreon.com slash hbmpodcast. I, I, you know, I've been doing this for like almost a decade, but I'm still really figuring this out as I go along. So your thoughts really are helpful here. And I also just want to say thank you again for supporting Here We Monsters for all these years. Support and generosity looks like a lot of things, and I'm very grateful for all of it. You know, whether that's money or kind words or honestly just you telling your weird friends about the show, it's all super helpful. And, you know, this is a small show. And so word of mouth, that just kind of person to person communication stuff is super important. You know, that's how the show grows. So thank you so much for listening. Season 10 is coming.